Hey guys, it's Bella. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are all having an incredible day today. In today's video, we're going to be covering another Australian Mystery Monday case. And I feel like I've definitely been doing mostly Australian cases lately. So I really hope that you guys have been enjoying that. As always, though, please feel free to leave any case suggestions you have in the comments down below, whether they're Australian or not. But in today's video, we're going to be talking about the Janine Balding case. And this case is actually pretty similar to the Anita Copy case, which I also have a video on that I'll link below if you guys are interested in checking that out. Both cases are just absolutely devastating and my heart really goes out to the friends and family of the victims. I watched some interviews with Janine's mother and father and her brother and they just broke my heart. Before we do get into the case, I just want to quickly thank today's sponsor Audible for making this video possible. I am always listening to audiobooks while I'm cleaning, cooking, driving, while I'm doing washing, while I'm working out, while I'm walking Mia because they keep me entertained while I'm doing all of those things. I'm just about to start listening to If We Were Villains by M.L. Rio because so many people recommended it because I really liked The Secret History by Donna Tart. I thought it was amazing. It had me on the edge of my seat. It's like a dark academia thriller sort of book. So definitely recommend it if you're into that sort of thing. But Audible seriously has something for everybody and all of their members get access to their Plus catalog, which has thousands of different audiobooks, podcasts, Audible original Originals, sleep tracks, guided fitness and meditation programs, and so much more. Members also get one free credit every single month, which is good for one title in the premium selection of bestsellers and new releases, and you get to keep it forever. So if you guys are interested in checking out Audible, you can get a 30-day free trial and check out their whole Plus catalog if you go to audible.com slash bellafiori, or you can also text bellafiori to 500-500. I will leave all of the information in the description down below, and let's go ahead and get into today's case. Janine Balding was born on the 7th of October in 1967 in Wagga Wagga to Kerry and Beverly Balding, who was known as Bev. She was the second of their children, and so she had an older sister named Carolyn. Four years after her birth, Bev and Kerry welcomed their third child, a daughter named Gail, and when Janine was 10, they had a son named David. Janine was described as a bubbly little girl and was always smiling. She had a small group of friends, but was very loyal to them, and she knew how to stand up for herself. Always a bubbly little girl and uh, stood up for herself well and truly as she was growing up and, and uh, she had a few little friends, not a lot, but a few little friends and she was a loyal friend to anybody. I remember in Canberra she got stuck between two beds there once because she was always looking around, always crawling around. We used to go a lot away with mum and dad or uh, Bev's ma, you know, for weekends. Um, and uh, she was... Uh, she was the, uh, the villain of the, the joy of the family. As she got older, she grew into a beautiful woman who was always willing to help people out. She left school in grade 10 after completing her school certificate and moved to Sydney. Her older sister Carolyn was already living in Sydney, so she and Janine shared the family's holiday apartment in Cronulla, and Janine got a job as a bank teller at the State Bank of New South Wales on George Street, which was in the Sydney CBD. In 1987, while living in Sydney, Janine met Steve Moran. He was a firefighter, they hit it off right away, and they were engaged by April 1980. They began planning their wedding and had set the date for March 1989 and they bought a house in Berkeley Vale which is about 50 kilometers north of Sydney which they rented out to help finance the wedding and they were just really excited for their future together. Janine was really excited to have kids. She loved kids. She was great with them. A few of her friends had children and she always helped out with them and she always helped out with her younger brother David as she was growing up and she was just really excited for their future together and to become a mother and a wife. On the 7th of September in 1988, Janine spent the night at Steve's place in Sutherland. It was a Wednesday night. She had work the next day on the 8th of September and instead of going home first, she decided to park at the Sutherland railway station and catch the train into work. She finished work at around 5 p.m. and went and caught the train back to her car, arriving at Sutherland station at about 6 p.m. Unfortunately though, that's as far as Janine would make it as she never returned home that night. The next morning on the 9th of September, police were called out to the F 
4 freeway in Western Sydney to investigate an abandoned car. There were underwear inside and a handbag nearby, so it was definitely looking a little sketchy. The detectives on the scene decided to organize a small search of the area, and they also ran the registration of the car and found that it belonged to Janine Baldy. So they call her work and they find that she hadn't gone into work that morning. They call her fiance Steve and he hadn't seen her since the previous night. They call her sister Carolyn and she had stayed at her boyfriend's the previous night so she didn't know if Janine had returned to the apartment or not but when she went back to their shared flat in Cronulla she found Janine hadn't been home at all. And so the police then ring Kerry and Bev in Wagga Wagga. And they said we found Janine's car. I said, oh, I didn't know it was missing. But they said, we can't find Janine. I said, oh, she's got to be around somewhere. They said, the car was found at Penrith. As soon as they said that, the penny dropped. He walked through the doorway and I knew by the look on his face, something was wrong. I could just tell, you know, the look on his face. So immediately, police got to work on the search for Janine. Detective Sergeant Kevin Rao was the one who coordinated the search, and he was actually also the same officer who led the inquiry into the murder of Anita Cobby. Detectives didn't have to look for very long, though, because that afternoon, 16-year-old Matthew Elliott and 14-year-old Bronson Blessington confessed to the workers at the Cobham Youth Refuge that they had stolen a car. The workers called the police, and the two boys were taken in for questioning and arrested for stealing the car, and then during the interview, they just pull out this yellow handled knife and they're like, we know about a girl that's been abducted and murdered and we can help you guys out. And I think the reason they did this, well, police think the reason they did this is because they'd been arrested for stealing this car and they thought if they gave this information about this abducted and missing girl and murdered girl, that police would help them out as well. So police asked these boys if they knew where this woman's body was and if they could take police to where her body was and the boys agreed. And Elliot and Blessington took detectives to a dam in the middle of a paddock in Mitchinbury at around midnight and it was there that the naked, bound and gagged body of a woman was found floating in the dam. The body was identified as that of 20 year old Janine Balding and at 3.45 a.m. on the 10th of September, Detective Rao notified Bev and Kerry Balding. As I'm sure you can imagine, they were in shock. They didn't want to believe it. They didn't want to believe that it was her body and they wanted to come to Sydney so that they could see the body, so that they could make sure that it was Janine. So Bev and Kerry flew into Sydney and they were taken to see the body and they formally ID'd the body as that of their daughter Janine Balding. It would obviously be such an incredibly hard and heartbreaking thing to have to deal with and not something that many people can relate to but Gary and Grace Lynch, Anita Cobby's parents, could. They had been through it themselves and they reached out to Bev and Kerry to be there and to support them and they really helped them to navigate such an extreme extremely difficult time as they had been through it themselves just two years earlier and they helped them to navigate the media and the public and the trial and just to be there for them as support. I mean I'd never been inside a court in my life and uh, neither had Kerry and, and uh, you know for us it was a big big thing to go inside this court and they sort of you know guided us along the way on quite a few aspects of what would happen. And I think it was great, uh, Gary rather, that gave me courage to speak up because he spoke, I always thought he spoke up so beautifully. And uh, that was one of the reasons I thought, well, if he can do that, I can do it too. And I have. Janine's autopsy was performed by a pathologist, Peter Ellis, and he determined that her cause of death was drowning, as she had dirty fluid in her mouth, in her throat, and in her lungs, which matched the dirty fluid in the dam. The autopsy also revealed that she had been brutally raped and had bruising all over her body. After guiding police to the murder scene, Elliot and Blessington were arrested. They were questioned extensively about the murder, and it was during this time that they implicated 15-year-old Wayne Wilmot, 18 year old Carol Ann Arrow, and 22 year old Stephen Jamison, who was known as Shorty because, well, he was short. Wilmot and Arrow were both arrested, and a national manhunt located Jamison at Southport Beach on the Gold Coast. He had been staying at the Salvation Army Hostel in Southport for the week prior until he was kicked out for being too drunk, and then just minutes after he was kicked out, one of the workers at the hostel heard about him on the radio and immediately 
immediately rang police who came and arrested him at Southport Beach. So let me tell you a little bit about these kids and what happened on the night of the 8th of September in 1988. We'll start with 14 year old Bronson Blessington. When he was six years old, his parents Steve and Barbara divorced, which he was traumatized by and he became fixated on trying to get them back together. Blessington and his sister lived with their mother who ended up sending him off to his father as Blessington would constantly misbehave and he would try and sabotage her relationships with men. Blessington and his father moved from one caravan park or boarding house to another again and again and again as his father chased work on fishing trawlers and in abattoirs. It was at these caravan parks with his father that Blessington was sexually assaulted by three different men. Two of these men were pensioners living at the caravan park in Tea Garden where Blessington was also living with his father at the time and he said that these men would corner him when he went into the shower blocks and that they would do everything that you could imagine to him and that he actually passed out from the pain. When they later moved to Goldburn, he said that one of his father's friends also assaulted him. By the time Blessington was 13, they moved to Sydney and Blessington was enrolled in year eight at Blacktown High, which was his 13th school. By this point, Steve said that he was out of control. He was sniffing petrol, he was stealing, he was getting into a lot of fights at school. He was also illiterate and was diagnosed by a psychiatrist as having the mental age of a nine-year-old. One time they were visited by police because Blessington had been caught selling weed and Steve didn't know what to do. He said to the police, he was like, what can I do? Can you guys just take him? Which of course they couldn't. The New South Wales Department of Community Services wasn't helping either. And so Steve told Blessington that if he didn't get his act together that he would send him to a boy's home. Then that very same night, Blessington went out and he didn't come back till morning and that was just the last straw for Steve. He sent him to an adult drug rehabilitation center, which I mean is probably not the best thing for a 13 year old to be hearing about all of these drugs people have been taking and crimes they've been committing and all of this other stuff. And then the Department of Community Services finally got involved and they agreed to send him to a refuge and then a home for wards of the state. He continued stealing and causing trouble and got kicked out, but none of his family wanted him back by this point. He called his mother Barbara, who was living in Queensland at the time with her new boyfriend and she said that she wouldn't take him in for another six months because he needed to prove himself. And so with nowhere to go, authorities sent him to Juvie. At Juvie, he met a kid named Scott and on the 8th of September, instead of going on the bushwalk that the Juvie had planned, they decided to go and do their own thing and they caught a train into Sydney Central Station where Scott introduced Blessington to some other street kids. He introduced him to 16 year old Matthew Elliott who had run away from home and whose past crimes included arson, burglary, and stealing cars. And he also introduced him to 15 year old Wayne Wilmot, who had been a ward of the state since he was five years old. These two boys told Blessington and Steve that they were in the most feared gang in Sydney and they invited them to come to their squat in Flemington. And I guess the kind of like dynamic they had because Blessington had been introduced to these big tough guys, um, he felt that he needed to impress them with his ability to steal food and alcohol and cigarettes and also his ability to fight. While they were together, Blessington actually punched this other kid named Wayne in the face so hard that he started bleeding. And then when he started bleeding, Elliot, who was like high on amphetamines, just went crazy and started bashing this kid with a hollow sledgehammer. Apparently it was so bad that Blessington actually thought that they had killed this kid, but they ran away before the police arrived. At that point, Steve left them and Wilmot and Elliot took Blessington to go meet up with some other street kids at Central Station. They met 15 year old Carol Ann Arrow, who was intellectually disabled and had just recently arrived in Sydney after running away from her home in a country town. And they also met up with 22 year old Shorty Jamison. He had run away from home at age 11 to live on the streets and he had a pretty extensive criminal record for sexual assault, robbery, and malicious wounding. After they all meet up, Elliot and Wilmot say to the group so casually, like, why don't we go and find a Sheila and rape her? Like it's some kind of joke. Like they said it as if I would say to Carrie, hey, let's go get ramen for dinner. And even worse than the casual suggestion to go and rape a random woman for fun is the fact that the rest of the people in the group agreed to it. So that afternoon they get on a train at Sydney Central Station and while on the train, they were just major pests, annoying everybody else on the carriage. They were showing off to each other. They, <laughs> why do I keep saying each other? <laughs> oh. 
They were showing off to each other, you know, thinking they were all big shots. Jamison at one point got out a porno mag and he was just making all of these gross remarks to another female passenger and like getting all in her face and it just sounded extremely uncomfortable. Eventually they get off at Sutherland Station where they find a woman named Christine Mubbly who they decide is going to be their victim. She was 19 years old at the time and had gotten to the train station after work at around 5.15 p.m. As she walked to her car she noticed this group of kids and immediately she thought they looked pretty sketchy she got her keys ready in her hand and started upping her pace to get to her car after getting into her car Jamison comes up to the window and starts asking her questions like do you have the time do you have any cigarettes do you have any money that you can give me she then noticed that he had pulled out a knife and so immediately she speeds off in her car back home and she tells her boyfriend Barry everything that happened and they decide to go down to the police station and make a report and the police write down everything that's happened but they said sorry it's just not serious for us to send a patrol car which okay I get the police can't send a patrol car out for every single thing that happens but surely you could send people out to tell these kids who are threatening and harassing people at a train station with a knife to bugger off before something happens so Christine and Barry go back to the train station to see if these kids are still harassing people as I mentioned Janine got off work at about five o'clock and arrived at the Sutherland train station at about 6 p.m. as she's walking to her car the boys come up to her and do the exact same thing they did to Christine. They ask her for the time, they ask her if she has any cigarettes, if she has any money. And then all of a sudden Elliot pulls a knife on her and tells her that he's gonna cut her face if she doesn't do exactly as he says and he takes her keys from her. Now Christine's boyfriend Barry actually has a broken leg so there's really not a lot that they can do in this situation to help her because they've already threatened Christine. They're not scared of her. They're not gonna stop because she comes out and some guy with a broken leg comes out and tells them to stop. So they immediately drive to the police station hoping that this is going to be enough for the police to send a patrol car out. And it is, but they go to the wrong car park. There's multiple car parks at Sutherland Station and they went to the one on the other side of the train station and by the time they got around to the correct car park, nobody was there because these boys had already abducted Janine. They forced her into the back seat of her car with Jamison, Blessington and Wilmot. Elliot was at the wheel and Carol Ann Arrow was sitting in the passenger seat. They drove west across the city to Minchinbury, which could be anywhere between a 40 minute and hour long drive. And during this time, the three boys in the back seat sexually assaulted and raped Janine at knife point. She had bruising all over her body when she was found. So it was clear that they had beaten her during this time as well. At one point during the drive, one of the boys said, I think it's a nice night for a murder, which how scary to hear that and know that you're going to die. I cannot even imagine. As they drove down the F4 freeway and past some open land in Minchinbury, Elliot pulls over the car into an emergency stopping lane. They drag Janine out of the car, gag her with a scarf and hog tie her. She's then raped again and they lift and throw her over a fence where her wrist was broken on impact. She was then carried into a paddock by Elliot, Blessington and Jamison. They took her into the dam and held her face down in the water, in the mud at the bottom and in the weeds and held her there until she drowned. After the murder, they had the audacity to steal the jewelry off her body. They stole her bank cards and her pin number, which she had written down on a piece of paper in her bag. They then got back into her car and started to drive, but the car broke down. So they left it on the side of the freeway and walked to Mount Druitt, where they withdrew some of her money and sold some of her jewelry. They then got a train into the city where they split up Elliot and Blessington confess what they had done to another street kid and then went and slept in Hyde Park. Afterward, they got a train to East Gosford where they threw Janine's cards into some scrub. They then stole a car and drove to the Cobham Youth Centre where they confessed to stealing the car and knowing where Janine's body was, which I spoke about earlier. After all five of these kids were arrested, every single one of them actually immediately confessed to the crime. However, they all tried to act like they weren't complicit, like it was all the other 
other kids and some of them also tried to implicate Blessington's friend Steve who I mentioned earlier he was the one that introduced Blessington to Elliot and Wilmot but Scott had an airtight alibi and he had actually left the group when they beat up that kid Wayne I mentioned this earlier he also tried to get Blessington to leave with him but Blessington obviously refused it didn't happen basically all of these kids spoke about the murder in third person they kept introducing all of these other people and they basically just kept trying to distance themselves from the crime but all five of them were charged with theft abduction sexual assault and murder and police began trying to gather evidence to try and reveal what really happened on the night of the 8th of September they got Christine Mobley in for a police lineup where she positively identified Elliot as one of the kids that approached her at the train station and as the kid who she saw intimidating Janine police also spoke to the owner of an army disposal store who confirmed that she had sold Elliot and Wilmot the yellow handled knife that had been used to intimidate Janine police checked Janine's bank records and found that her card had been used after the murder at an ATM in Mount Druitt to withdraw money which was just five minutes away from Minchinbury this also ties in with what another witness named Matthew Simmons came forward and said. He said he knew Elliot and he told police that he had seen him and the other kids at the shops in Mount Druitt and he said they were filthy. They had mud all over their hands and face and legs and feet. Absolutely filthy. They, a lot of them had mud on their hands, some had it on their face. One guy, his hair was all matted and grubby looking, that little animal looking bloke said it wasn't him, but it was definitely him. Nobody else looks like that. A jewellery dealer also came forward to police with one of Janine's rings and said that one of the boys had sold it to him the night of the murder and he said that when they came into the store they were covered in mud, there was mud all over their legs and the mud was still wet. Detectives also learned that Wilmot had stolen Janine's watch and had given it to Carol Ann Arrow as a gift. On top of all of this there was DNA evidence to connect them to the crime and this case was actually pretty crazy because it was the first time in Australian legal history that DNA was used in a case to secure convictions. When the five kids were arrested their DNA was taken and it was sent over to the UK because at the time the UK was like the world leader in DNA analysis and this DNA proved beyond a doubt that they were involved in the murder, sexual assault and rape of Janine Balding. Months later this evidence was presented at a committal hearing and all five were committed to stand trial. Janine's mother Bev decided to attend every single day of the court proceedings. She wanted to know everything that happened and she wanted to see that justice was served. I was determined I'd go. I wanted to know what happened because Janine was the type of person that would come home and tell me everything that happened to her in her day-to-day -day life and that was one of the reasons why I felt now I've got to know everything that happened. Uh, you know I was just shocked to think that young kids that age could do what they did to Janine. I just could not believe, you know, that young boys would be doing the things that they did to her. Kerry stayed home with their 10 year old son, David, who took it all really hard. And I mean, of course he took it hard. Like he was going through a horrible thing, dealing with the brutal murder of his sister. No, uh, it's just, it's been hard. It's, it's been really hard. No one, uh, you're 10 years old and, uh, you don't really understand what's going on. He was terrified at night and he couldn't sleep with the window open. And, you know, Kerry tried to put on a brave face for him, but it must have been so hard having so much pressure on him to not only be dealing with the brutal loss of his daughter, but also to continue putting on a brave face for the rest of his children. As the story of what happened the night of Janine's murder was presented in court, not a single one of those five kids showed any remorse. They were all laughing and joking. They were making these like remarks to the reporters and gestures to the reporters and the reporters would look back at them and make gestures like you're going to jail sort of thing. These boys would even turn around to Janine's mother Bev and laugh at her and make jokes at her like it's just so foul. Three weeks after the trial began these kids turn around to police and they're like hey Shorty Jamison actually wasn't with us it was this other kid named Shorty Wells and then because of that the whole trial has to be aborted while 
while police go and find this Shorty Wells guy. Like they've been sitting there this whole time through the committal hearing, through the trial, through everything, and have never mentioned this kid once. And then randomly they're like, oh yeah, this kid Shorty Wells was involved and the trial has to be scrapped. And Janine's poor family has to go through the waiting while they find Shorty Wells and then has to go through a whole another trial. So police go and find the Shorty Wells kid and he's a self-confessed devil worshipper who thinks that the devil sits on one of his shoulders and tells him what to do. He's ruled out pretty quickly because there's no evidence to tie him to the crime and he has a solid airtight alibi and this whole thing has been a wild goose chase. Before the second trial gets started, the murder charges against Wilmot are dropped as the prosecution accepted he had stayed in the car with Carol Ann Arrow when Janine was actually murdered. He pled guilty to rape, abduction and theft and was sentenced to just 10 years in prison and we'll talk about him a bit more later on. The charges against Carol Ann Arrow were also dropped because of her serious intellectual disability and the fact that the prosecution accepted that she stayed in the car during the murder and was not involved in the sexual assault. The second trial began in 1990 and Shorty Wells was actually one of the first people to give evidence. So probably not the best idea of them to have tried to randomly implicate him for no reason. Shorty Jamison's participation in the crime was also established by three separate witnesses. One of these witnesses was Matt Simmons, who I spoke about earlier, who saw him in Mount Druitt with Elliot the night of the murder. Another witness was the woman Jamison messed with on the train on the way to Sutherland Station. And the third witness was actually actually one of his prison cellmates who came forward to say that he had confessed to him that he had murdered Janine and that he would do it again. The trial lasted four weeks and Shorty Jamison, Matthew Elliott and Bronson Blessington were all found guilty of abduction, sexual assault, robbery and murder. Despite their ages, Blessington being just 14 years old at the time, Justice Newman sentenced them to life in prison for the rest of their natural lives, meaning that there is no possibility of parole. And Blessington was actually the youngest person to ever receive this sentence in Australia. I'm going to quickly read you a quote of what Justice Newman said when sentencing. To sentence people so young to a long term of imprisonment is of course a heavy task. However, the facts surrounding the commission of these crimes are so barbaric that I believe I have no alternative other than to impose upon these young prisoners, even despite their age, a life sentence. So grave is the nature of this case that I recommend that none of the prisoners in the matter should ever be released. Least. The New South Wales Parliament in 1997, 2001 and 2005 passed three different pieces of legislation to ensure that they and other notorious criminals would never be released. All three appealed the decision multiple times, but all appeals were denied. In 2007, Elliot and Blessington were granted an additional appeal because there was a staple missing from their file. So it was argued that because the Crown indictment wasn't stapled to the court file, it wasn't fixed to the court file as required by law, and so the judgment technically wasn't finalised. Luckily though, this appeal was also rejected. Now I've got to read you this part as well because there was a lot of big terms in it, but in 2014, in October, the United Nations Human Rights Committee ruled that because the sentences allowed no genuine chance of release, even with full rehabilitation, that Blessington and Elliott's sentences breached the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child because they were just 14 and 16 years old and they asked the Australian government to reconsider the case. Despite this though, the sentences were not changed. In February of 2016, Blessington lodged another appeal appeal to be released stating that he was only 14 at the time he committed the murder and that he had since changed, he'd found God and he was extremely remorseful for his actions. Despite his supposed remorse though, he never once tried to reach out to the family and apologize, never tried to send a letter to them, nothing. And this appeal was denied. Wayne Wilmot, as I mentioned, was sentenced to just 10 years in jail. He was actually released on a good behavior bond in 1996 after serving just seven years. And then over the next two years, after after his release, he went on to rape and sexually assault four women. He was sent back to prison in 2000 for these crimes and went into the Cubit Sex Offenders course and he was actually sacked from the course after exposing himself to nurses, being aggressive to a TAFE teacher and was violent with his primary therapist. 
He even said, most women are sluts and they get what they deserve. He was due to be eligible for parole in 2019, but the New South Wales government stepped in and he has since been classed as one of only six people, including terrorists in New South Wales, to be deemed too dangerous to ever be released. And of course he remains in jail to this day. Bev Balding passed away in 2015 and she fought to the very end to keep Janine's killers behind bars. They took Janine's life for no reason whatever. I mean, she didn't know them. She, she was a stranger to them and they just sort of came into her life in that sort of second of time and, and then committed all the cruel deeds that they committed on her and then decided she might tell someone they'd get rid of her. Mm. I cannot, for the life of me, never ever will forgive them for what they did. And if you ever do get out, there's no way you can hide because <laughs> we'll find you. With the help of Jeanette Fife Yeomans, she released a memoir that spoke about the whole horrific story, which was titled The Janine Balding Story. But that is all of the information that I have on this case. It is such a horrific and devastating case, and my heart really goes out to her family, her friends, her fiance. I cannot imagine what it would be like to go through such a horrific ordeal. As always, I would love to discuss your thoughts in the comments down below, and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day and hopefully I will see you in my next video. Bye guys.